Good morning. We're doing the, um, if you watch the John study this morning, then you know that we're, we're also doing the next Revelation study today because we're going fishing. The ocean is calm tomorrow. So anyway, um, uh, we're back here and I think this is number six, study number six in our study of Revelation. We're just getting into the text after doing quite a few introductory matters um, such as recapitulation and so forth, those things that we that we talked about. Uh, and we'll be coming back to those things for review as well. Um, so let's, uh, let's pray and we'll start. Father, we ask your blessing on our study of your word. And, and uh, this is a book that pronounces a blessing for those who uh, read it and hear it and obey it. And, and so we ask that that blessing would be on us, that we would come to your word uh, humbly to be taught and that we would come in faith, believing what you say. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Let me just start at verse 1 here and read down through uh, verse uh, oh, verse 8 there. And uh, we've already commented on verses 1 through 3, but we'll just start from the beginning here. The revelation of Jesus Christ, with, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore a witness to the word of God, and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. And you remember we talked about those phrases, the time is near, things that must soon take place, and, and so on. All right, verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ru and the ruler of, the ki of kings on the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. All right, well, let's uh, flip over to my notes here, and uh, we'll start at verse 4, where we read um, this greeting, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And then if you connect that with verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and so on. And uh, the, the reason I read verse 5 there then is that you see that John is writing this, uh, he's writing the book of Revelation as an epistle. It's, it is a letter to the to the. To the church, it sounds a lot like uh, the other New Testament epistles in the in the way that there's these these greetings, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you, and peace, and uh, and so this this book of Revelation is not only you know as we've said it's it's apocalyptic in nature in that it's full of these. Uh, revelatory visions that are given to John. It's communicated to us in signs, but nevertheless, it is a letter that is written to, to us, and, it, and it's to be understood. It's to be read. It's to be obeyed. It's, it's to be understood every bit as much as all the other New Testament letters, like 
the book of Romans and, and, and so forth. So you see that in the language and the pronouncement here, grace and, and to you and, and peace, John to the, to the seven churches. Now, right off the bat here then, early on, we come across this number seven. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. And then at the end of the verse, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So we need to uh, learn a little bit about this business of seven. You know, numbers are pretty big time in, uh, in the book of Revelation. You think, and, and particularly this verse, this uh, number seven. So think of, remember the series of judgments here. If I can get it right. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls, right? So what is all of this seven stuff? Well, listen to uh, G.K. Beale on this. I'm reading from Beale's The Big Book, all right? The big version here. Um, and listen to what he says. Um, he comments on this being an epistle for starters. John combines the category of apocalyptic prophecy with that of an epistle, a letter. The seven churches refer to seven historical churches in Asia. Okay, he is, he, John is writing immediately to seven real churches that are in the province of Asia, Smyrna, Philadelphia, and, and so forth. But, Beale says, the number seven could hardly have arisen by chance. This was the favorite number, uh, this is the favorite number of the apocalypse of, of Revelation, which has been influenced, I don't have my microphone on my shirt here, it's probably been picking up okay, but maybe this is a little better. Um, this is the favorite number of the Apocalypse, which has been influenced by the Old Testament preference for the number all the time. All the time we're going to be coming back to the Old Testament to understand um, re uh, Revelation. In the Old Testament, seven was used to mean fullness, that is, the time necessary for something to be done effectively, or a general designation of thoroughness or completeness. Sometimes seven in the Old Testament is both literal and figurative. For example, in Leviticus chapter 4, we have the phrase sprinkling blood seven times. Now that's both a literal action, the priest sprinkling blood seven times, but it's also a figurative representation of a complete and effective act. At other times, it's purely figurative and means completeness. So for example, in Leviticus 26, God will punish Israel seven times if they do not repent. That doesn't mean seven distinct acts of judgment, but it means fullness, intensity, his, his full wrath will be upon them for if they don't, if they don't repent. The idea, of, now get this, this is important and, and helpful. The idea of completeness comes from the creation account. You know, where else have we heard the number of seven? Number seven, right? Well, God creates the earth in six days and he rests on the seventh. There's seven days of, of, of creation. The idea of completeness originates from the creation account in Genesis 1, where the six days of creation are followed by the consummate seventh day of God's rest. And so Beale goes on, therefore, it is against this background and in the light of the clear figurative use of seven elsewhere in Revelation, that the number seven here, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, um, must be figurative also for fullness. Okay, so 
So John is writing literally to seven literal churches in Asia in his day, but this number seven tells us that he's writing uh, to someone else, all right? So what kind of fullness is in mind here? John to the fullness of the churches, John to all, all of the churches, okay? So here's what Beale says. The number seven here is an instance of, ha, here's one of these words. You'll have had this in Bible study methods back in, in, in Bible college, you know. Never remember the, all of these phrases when, anyway, but it, synecdoche, synecdoche. You don't have to remember that, but, uh, the, but, but Beale says this is an instance of this figure of speech that is called a synecdoche. What's that? It is a figure of speech in which the part represents the whole. The part represents the whole. John to the seven churches. The seven churches in Asia, and we know this because the number seven in Scripture means fullness or completeness. John to the, John to the seven churches in Asia means John to the church. John to the church. Listen again here. Um, the seven historical churches of Asia are here viewed as representative of all the churches and therefore the church universal in John's day and in the entire church age, including in our day as well. Um, a, and, a per, and a reference to the full church universal, another indication that John is writing to to us, to, the, to um, all of God's elect in all, all the churches, in all, the, uh, all eras of church history, is also seen in Revelation by the figurative reference to worldwide judgments in the number of the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. So these judgments are not, are not localized judgments, but they are judgments upon, um, upon, upon the whole. And also, uh, after chapters 2 and 3, after the letters to the churches are done and we come to chapter 4, it is the universal church that becomes center stage with no further mention of individual congregations. So you have the letters to the churches in chapters 2 and 3, but when you come to chapter 4, you never hear again about the church at Smyrna, the church at Pergamum, the church at Laodicea. No, you, you, you don't hear that. What, what you have after that is that you have the universal church, all of, all of God's elect that becomes center stage. And as Beale says, there's no further mention of these individual congregations. And so... Um, so what you and, um, and then also the whole book, all of the judgments that it, that it records and so forth are are universal. They're 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 worldwide. Well, all of this is evidence that tells us that when John is writing this book, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, he is uh, this is Christ's letter to his church, to all of his church in in. In, in all ages, okay? Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Now, here's another instance of, uh, of a matter of looking to, it always will be. We look back to the Old Testament. Why does Christ represent himself here as the one, here's Christ giving, pronouncing grace and peace to us, and then he describes himself as him who is and who was and who is to come. It's a little bit out of order, isn't it? You know, you would expect from him who was and then from him who is and who is, who is to come. So, um, so what's going on here? Well, this title is given to us 
for our encouragement. It is a reference to, um, it has as its background, the self-existence and eternality of God, particularly as seen in Exodus 3.14, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Remember? And, and he, Moses wanted to know God's name, and God said, I am Yahweh, right? I, I am the, self-exist, the self-existing God. And it's, it's a name, it's a title. This is just another way of Jesus saying, I am. You know, I am, this is Yahweh. I am, who am I? I am him who is and who was and who, and who is to come. And so that name is speaking about Christ's sovereign rule over everything, past, present and uh, and future so just as he brought israel out of bondage in egypt he's redeemed us in christ he's brought us out of satan's kingdom we can know that he will effect our future exodus out of this evil world and bring and furthermore that he is um, ruling right now okay he is You'll see this again here when he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, which represents the fact he's Alpha. He, he's the beginning, Omega, he's the end, and he's everything, everything in between. The book of Revelation shows us a true perspective of the history of the world and the past, present, and future, okay? It, it gives us a look behind things. The things that we see in this world happening don't seem to make a lot of sense, right? And they're evil and discouraging. And it, and it gives us a look behind the scene. Here's what's really going on. God pulls back the curtain. And what do we see? Well, we see God's in control. He always has been, him who was, he is today, he he who is, and uh, he will be forever, him who is is to come, all right? So this is a very, that's a very significant um, uh, description of himself. Here's a quote by Beale here. Confidence in God's sovereign guidance of all earthly affairs instills courage in us to stand strong in the face of difficulties that test our faith. This is the point of the Old Testament expression which lies behind the one who is and who was and who, and who is coming. Um, let's see here. Did I have... Another, I guess, oh, okay, those come later on. Um, all right. Um, so you, you see the point there. Here's God's in control. God is everything. He, he is the one that brought everything into creation and in, in created in, in, into existence, right? From him who was. He's the one who did this. He's the one who is to come, who all these things... You know, he's, getting, he's orchestrating, he's in sovereign control of everything, and he's in control of everything now. That is to say then, in that sense, this world is not spinning out of control. Um, I mean, in a, in a way it is, it's spinning toward judgment, right? It's, it's, it's perishing, but be, nothing is happening that is not according to God's will. And, uh, and that he, he is directing it then all, always has been, is now, and al- always will be. Now, you also see here in verse 4, John to the seven churches, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So here's this seven business again. 
Who are these seven spirits? Well, this is an allusion to the book of Zechariah. Okay, the book of Zechariah. The seven spirits who are before his throne. And we are meant to think about, to remember Zechariah. Here it is, Zechariah chapter 4. And the angel, is this on the screen, Verla? Then, okay. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me. I, I, sh I should ask Verla here, is this smaller print, you think, or should I go back to the uh, other screen? It should be okay, all right. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. So here's Zechariah the prophet, right? And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Now, here's what's going on. Um, Zechariah was a prophet after the Babylonian captivity at the time under Ezra and Nehemiah, the, the people are, re, you know, the remnant is returning to Judah and they're going to rebuild the walls of, 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 of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And so here's this almost like impossible mission. And Zerubbabel at the time, he is in the messianic line. He's like the king and he's, so that he and the returnees are going back there, and uh, and and Zechariah is is a prophet to them, and so this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. That is to say, historically, the temple would be rebuilt, but it would be done not by man's power, but by, but by the Spirit's power. Okay, and so that has all kinds of implications then for us, uh, for us today, and we'll talk about those a little bit, a little bit later. But when, in other words, when when John gives us this greeting, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, we are to think of that vision that was given to Zechariah for Zerubbabel and the returnees to encourage them, and we are to be encouraged by them, and we know that what? The seven spirits are, that's just a way of saying the fullness of the Spirit of God. So what you have here in, in Revelation 1 is uh, you, you have all the members of the Trinity here, right? You have God the Father, you have uh, Him who is and who was, who is to come, the seven, the seven spirits, and then verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Okay, so greetings from all the members of the Trinity. And, and we are also to think of, we're to be encouraged by this image of the seven spirits because it, it harkens us back to Zechariah 4 and it tells us that when, that um, as Christ is giving us this grace to you and peace, greeting in, in Revelation, he intends for us to be encouraged by the fact, by, encouraged by the same message that was given through this vision of seven spirits to Zechariah. Um, that same encouragement is to be given to us today in a much more broad sense to apply to the whole church. And what's, what's the encouragement? 
not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Grace, grace to it. That is to say, Christ's church is, is being built, and it is not being built by human might or by human power, but, but by his spirit. God pronouncing his blessing, grace, grace to it. And, and so as we go through Revelation, the book of Revelation, all of these things that uh, we're, we're going to encounter, this final judgment leading up to final judgment and the, the wicked and, and the conquering and the victory of, of Christ's people is not dependent upon us. It's not, it's not something that we have to, we are going to pull off or we even can pull off, but Christ is going, is going to do it. I think this image of this vision uh, that Zechariah had is kind of like this. Uh, of course, again, you know, we're gonna and we're gonna meet some lampstands here right soon in uh, in the book of Revelation. But it's like uh, this image of uh, this lampstand, all of gold. It's a bowl on top of it. So this lampstand, and what fuels it? How do the, how do the flames burn in the lampstand? Well, if I understand it, it's by oil, right? Specifically, olive oil. And in this vision, this lampstand uh, has seven lamps on it. And and somehow or another, then there's these two olive trees. So it's like, it's like what are the olive trees the source of the oil, right? And they're, and, they're, and they're feeding it. So that oil and the trees and the, the whole thing, the idea is the lampstand, the, in, in uh, Zerubbabel's day, the, the temple that would be built, the lampstand that would be in it. In our day, it's the lampstand of Christ in, in the church, as we'll see in chapters 2 and 3. And it's being fueled by an inexhaustible supply of olive oil, all right? So it's a picture of Christ's spirit working and empowering his church so that so that uh, our dependence and, and, and the entire dependence for God's decree to be carried out is not by human might, not by human power, but by his spirit. And it's, and it's inexhaustible, you see. Okay, all those things we're, we are to think of. Verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his, by his blood. Um, now, here's Christ third person of the Trinity, he's described as the faithful witness. If there's ever a witness who's faithful, it's Christ. He is the Word. He's the the Word of God. He came into this world. He faithfully bore witness to everything the Father had given him to speak. In addition to that, he is the firstborn of the dead. There's a reference to his resurrection. And also, since he's the firstborn, the first raised, that means what? There's a great harvest yet to come of our resurrection. <clears throat> he is the ruler of the kings on earth. <clears throat> the kings of the earth are seen in Scripture as enemies right? Enemy kings. You'll come across <clears throat> in the Bible here and there a godly king. Think of Josiah, David, and, and some others. But for the most part, the kingdoms of this world and their rulers are set against Christ. But <clears throat> nevertheless, and certainly in John's day, what have you got? You got Rome. Rome, the, Rome, the Roman Empire is an enemy of the church, enemy of Christ's kingdom. 
But what do we have here, once again, given to us for our encouragement? Christ is the ruler of the kings. He is the king of kings. He is their ruler. So <clears throat> even though you have these haughty rulers, arrogant rulers that, that act as if they are God themselves, and you have them right all down through history, the fact of the matter is, he who sits in the heavens laughs, right? What is that, Psalm 2? I think, let's, let's check that out. It's a good, very good illustration. John may want us to, to um, have that in mind. I always get Psalm 2 and Psalm 8 mixed up. Yeah, here it is. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together <clears throat> against the Lord and against his anointed, his Christ, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. And look at God. So here's this rebellious kings of the earth. They're always, they want to be God. Because after all, the God of this world is, is Satan, right? He's, he's behind them. And, uh, and here's God's response to it all. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. He will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Okay, So there is what um, John has in mind here uh, in, in, in in, in our passage that um, the, the kings of the earth are ruled by Christ. And even if they won't acknowledge it, they will acknowledge it someday. John, I won't take the time to go to, to Psalm 89, but these phrases, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, and Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the dead, those phrases which describe Christ are drawn straight out of Psalm 89, verses 27 and 37. And so when Jesus, well, Psalm 89, when it's using those phrases, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, it's talking about the Messiah. And so when the New Testament here applies those phrases, those titles, faithful witness, firstborn of the dead, to Christ, it's telling us he is the Messiah. This, 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 is, this is the one. Now look at verse 6. And made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, we need to take a look at this phrase here. It's, it's important for a, for a number of reasons. Um, let's see here, page 19 of Beal. I read this before, gave you another example of it, but this is, this is important. Um, I'll read that in a second. This phrase, <clears throat> we're told here, that Christ has made us, all believers, has made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. All right? This is an accomplished fact. Christ's people are, have been made a kingdom and priests. Kingdom and priests. Um, now, if we go back to the Old Testament, we find that phrase fairly often. You also find it fairly often in the New Testament. For example, Exodus 19, verse 6. Okay, we're, so we're back in the book of Exodus. Who obviously then is God talking to here? Well, it, it's, the, it's the Jews. It's it's Israel, just as they're coming out of, of Egypt. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. All right. Now that was God's command to the Jews who came out of Egypt under Moses. His purpose for them would, was that they become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, right? Um, what does that mean? Well, they would be a kingdom that represented God faithfully to the nations, an entire kingdom of priests, not just Levitical priests, but an entire kingdom of priests. And they would be a, a holy nation, a nation serving the Lord, mediating God, you might say, to all the nations of the earth, right? And then by implication that they would go. Now, did that happen? <laughs> no way. The Old Testament is the story, but I mean, I mean, they didn't hardly have their feet. Well, their feet were dry after they went across the Red Sea because it was dried up. But, but they had hardly got across the Red Sea, but what they're worshiping idols and grumbling and so on. So they never were. Historic Israel never was, uh, uh, never did fulfill this intent, right? A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, as it turns out, they're just a, a picture of it supposed to be a picture of it, but, but this intent for Israel by God is fulfilled where? In the true Israel, in the church. So, for example, look at 1 Peter 2 here. But you, who's he talking to? The Jews? No, he's talking to the church, Christ's people, the true Israel. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that's not the only place in the New Testament where that phrase, <clears throat> a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, is applied then to the church. Okay. You understand this now that God, uh, God's purpose in establishing a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession so that he could dwell among us and we with him, and so that we can proclaim the excellency, the proclaim to who? To all creation. That 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 intent was only typified a picture in Old Testament Israel, and Old Testament Israel miserably failed there, but in Christ, we have become the, the, true, the true Israel, right? So here again is an example of a couple of things. One, how foolish it is for Christians to be um, oh, I'm trying to think of the term uh, besides foolish. For a Christian to be so enamored with the earthly nation of Israel, right? Israel this, Israel that, Jerusalem this, Jerusalem that. You got your eyes set on the wrong thing here, right? Yeah. You're looking at the sign when the reality is, is, is over here. Um, God's intent here, this whole kingdom of priests and holy nation, is fulfilled in Christ and therefore by his people who are, who are in Christ. Okay, that's, that, is, that is who we, that's who we are. So... Um, that's all wrapped up. All of that is wrapped up in this, in verse 6. He's made us a kingdom priest to his, priest to his God. Um, now, oh yes, I wanted to go back. Now, now, this is an example of what Beale calls broadening the Old Testament. And this is vital. for uh, If we're going to understand Scripture properly, 
This is absolutely essential for us to understand. Um, I used Hebrews as an example of this when we looked at it before. Hebrews chapters 8, 9, and 10 that talks about uh, how the prophecy of Jeremiah 31, which says, you know, behold, days are coming when I will make uh, a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And we saw Hebrews in Hebrews that that very passage is quoted, but clearly the house of Israel and the house of Judah with whom the new covenant is made is the church. It's not the earthly nation of Israel. It's not the physical seed of <clears throat> Abraham. Well, what we've got here then is still another example of this, and there'll be other examples in Revelation. What we have here then in this phrase, and made us, his church, us, a kingdom and priest to his God, is another example of broadening the New Testament or the Old Testament. And, and what that means is this broadening. It is the New Testament showing us the fullness and fulfillment of something which was shown only in picture form in the Old Testament. Okay. So listen to Beal again on this. I say again because I read it a week or two ago, but here we go. A final point here is to be made concerns the way in which John takes Old Testament references and universalizes them. What in the Old Testament is applied to Israel is given a much wider sense by John. For instance, God gave Israel the title Kingdom of Priests, Exodus chapter 19. But John applies this title to the church. Another example, where Zechariah 12 verse 10 states that the tribes will mourn over the Messiah, the reference in Zechariah in the Old Testament is to Israel, the nation Israel. But John widens Zechariah 12 to include all the tribes of the earth. We'll see that here in, in verse 7, right? Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him. And check it out. All the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Well, it, when Zechariah gave the prophecy, it was that the reference was to Israel would uh, wail on account of him. But no, John widens it to all the tribes of the earth. And again, the concept of the Exodus plagues is extended by John from just the land of Egypt in the Old Testament to the whole earth. So, in Revelation, in these judgments, we're going to come across the Exodus plagues again. But this time, it's not going to be just to Egypt in the time of Israel. It is going to be uh, brought upon the entire earth. The three and a half years of Israel's tribulation in Daniel are extended to the tribulation of the church as the true Israel throughout the world. Um, and this tribulation is instigated not by Daniel's, not by the literal city of Babylon in Daniel's day, but by the end time Babylon. So Babylon in Revelation becomes the world, the, the world system that persecutes not just Daniel and his fellow Israelites, but who persecutes all the, the true believers in, uh, in the church throughout the world. Um, <clears throat> in Revelation, when Babylon falls, it is the cities of the nations of the world that fall. Uh, the benefits, he, Beale goes on to give examples of this broadening or universalization. The benefits of the end time temple seen in Ezekiel's visions are no longer reserved for the 
historic Jews only, but are for all believing peoples, all peoples of all nations who are Christ's people. The leaves, which are for the healing of Israel, Ezekiel 47, talking about, uh, that's where Ezekiel has his vision. And in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel, those leaves are for the healing of Israel. But in Revelation, the leaves appear again for the healing of the nations. Okay? And another one, the lampstands of the ark in, in the temple now represent the churches, chapters 2 and 3. And the manna, the physical manna given to Israel in the wilderness in Revelation becomes spiritual manna for all believers. And, and, he, and then he goes on to just give us many more examples. And he says, the reason for such universalization is rooted, now get this, is rooted in the New Testament's understanding that the work of Christ and how through Christ the promise given to Abraham has been extended to the nations. Uh, I didn't read that right. That's a, there's a period there. But when these nations trust in Jesus, who is the true Israel, they identify with him and thus become part of the true Israel riding on the Israelite coattails of Jesus. John's use of the Old Testament in Revelation should not, therefore, be seen as an abuse of its true meaning. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, when we interpret Revelation as we are, as I've just been talking about, you, you'll hear the futurists, the dispensationalists, a lot of times they'll be, they'll be crying foul, Oh, you, you guys are, are misusing. But really, you know, their argument is with John. Because this is how he is applying those Old Testament concepts. He's applying them as fulfilled in Christ, in the church, which is the true Israel. John's use of the Old Testament in this way, through universalization, right, broadening, should not be seen as an abuse of its true meaning. John simply understands that the, the Old Testament as prophetically pointing forward to the events of the New Testament and to Christ. And he does so in the same way that Jesus himself and all the other New Testament writers did. The true people of God are now seen to be those who trust in the Savior promised in the Old Testament. And believers from every nation, Jew and Gentile alike, constitute God's new covenant people. The continuation, not the replacement, but the continuation of true Israel. It was likewise prophesied in the Old Testament that such people would be those upon whom God would in the latter days pour out his spirit and upon whose hearts he would write his law. History is united by the plan of a sovereign God. In this history, the work of Christ interprets what's gone before, yet cannot be understood properly without it. Everything God has given in Christ can and must be understood against the backdrop of the Old Testament revelation. Okay, you see that now, and I, we could go, we'll be coming back to that theme over and over again. But this is what John does. And the whole New Testament does it. Jesus did it. All the apostles, the Word of God does this. It, it, it takes the work, the person, and the work of Christ and it, it quotes, it takes then the Old Testament and said, this is that. This, in Christ, and in his church, in the true Israel, the true people of God, this is what that, in the Old Testament, was pointing to. Okay, 
So that's why you will have um, this universalization, this, this handling then of, of the Old Testament and attempts to make, to, to limit then the New Testament to the physical nation of Israel and make the church being some, some side alternate plan B that God had, but the real thing is about Israel and the earthly Jerusalem and so forth. Um, uh, it, that is like to totally, totally take this massive dead-end detour in understanding Scripture. Um, if, as, as long, and I know this because this was what happened to me, as long as you are taught this business that when the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, uses the word Israel, it always, always, always means the Jew. It means the physical descendant of Abraham. And when it talks about Jerusalem, it's talking about earthly Jerusalem. And when it's talking about the promised land, it's talking about the literal geography over there in, in, in the Middle East and so on. As long as you're wrapped up in that kind of an understanding of the Bible, you'll never understand the Bible. You'll, ne you'll never get it. You'll, 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 you'll miss things. And, and in some cases, not in all, but there have been some instances where you know, people like that will, they'll come like to the book of Hebrews and they'll say, oh, that Hebrews is not for the church. Hebrews is just for the Jew and all of this weird stuff. You, you won't be able to know heads or tails when it comes to understanding then um, the Bible. So, so this business of, of John's universalization and broadening, taking the Old Testament and then showing us how it's fulfilled in Christ is a vital part of understanding the book of, of Revelation. Well, we better stop right there then, and we will plan to pick up with uh, cha uh, verse, chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. That's a, Here we go again, another Old Testament. That's right out of the book of, of Daniel. And we'll look a little more closely then at that quote from, uh, from Zechariah. And, uh, and proceed then. So, Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that in Christ we are joined to him and the, the promises to Abraham of salvation and the new heavens and the new earth and new creation are, are our inheritance now. And uh, thank you for all that you've done for us in Christ, for washing away our sins that we might stand justified before you. And we give you... All this thanks in Christ's name. Amen.